Kia ora, talofa, namaste, mai, and welcome to this week's A Niche Cache A Variety Show. We are from the Niche Cache, where we like to broadcast Aotearoa sporting excellence. And prior to this, we have recorded our Patreon podcast for the Patreon Fano. Shout out to all the patrons supporting the Niche Cache. And you can help us on our mission to broadcast Aotearoa Sporting Excellence by joining the Patreon Fano, patreon.com forward slash EL Niche Cache. That's L Niche Cache, patreon.com forward slash L Niche Cache. Get extra podcasts every week as well as just the good vibes of keeping all of this in alignment. Us producing the Aotearoa Sporting content and you enjoying it and supporting it and keeping us on track every Monday and Friday. We deliver an email banger via Substack, the nichecase.substack.com. And there's always extra Kiwi Sporting bits and updates and whatnot that we don't necessarily write at the, the niche-case.com. So our website is where we like to do the deep dives and then our email banger every Monday and Friday evening. We add a little bit of newsy, updatey, extra yarns, as well as all the regular niche cache content and uh, delivered with that email banger straight to your inbox. And of course, we're always writing about Aotearoa sports at the niche-cache.com. We always start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness, wobbly wildcard. Can you please kick us off with a splash of mindfulness? That I can. Um, splashing in with um, all my novelist and poet Jack Kerouac here. Uh, slightly slightly different theme i think to some of the ones we've been doing more recently but he once said one day i will find the right words and they will be simple one day one day one day i'll find the, the right the words the never ending quest will... the eternal uh sort of hunting for something you know the 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 meaning of life stretching towards something you never quite grasp you know how it goes the artist's um the artist's way of life i think is probably a good way to look at that striving for something greater one day i will find the right words and it'll be simple and they will be simple and they will be simple there you go anything we can take from that to apply to our everyday lives and ground that and make it practical i mean the way i the way i think of that is like um as I say, like it, it's, it's the artist's creed kind of thing. It's the, it's the way to live a creative life is always striving for something a little bit better than you've done before. But then I also like that he does come back around in a way with that quote where he's like, one day I will achieve this like life goals of mine. Um, obviously a writer, so he's talking about finding the right words, but you can apply that to any old thing. Um, one day I will get there. And when I do, it'll be simple. Like everything just sort of, when you get there, it's all like, it's not a complicated thing. You're not climbing and making it harder and harder and harder the more you work. The more you work, the not the easier it gets, but the simpler the simpler the um the outcome becomes. Like the, the right words aren't gonna be some complicated, like three thousand page um, you know, war and peace part two or, or whatever. The right, right words might be like a, a two-line poem or something like that. This is metaphorically speaking, but um like the quest doesn't necessarily mean regardless of how difficult the quest might be and the quest in our case to make it a grounded thing is just like living a good life right like you just think of it in that term like what well, one day i will get to what i'm trying to achieve and it'll be simple um it's yeah it's um regardless of how difficult the quest itself might be the outcome doesn't have to be complicated and generally is not complicated I think you can keep it a lot more simpler than that, Wild I Keep it simple, stupid. You got yeah. a on a, on a <laughs> you got, you got something. We've got to nail it down. Like practical here, like day to day business, day to day mahi. Just simplicity is key. Just keep it simple, because then you're when you're operating from that simplicity and you're um, moving out of complex ideas and the wishy washy nature of thoughts and whatever else that comes your way. If you can just keep everything you're doing nice and simple, that is the, the best way to move through life and best way to move through the day. Don't complicate yourself with uh, bits of information from here, there, and everywhere. Just find a bit of simplicity because that's how you know, going to your quote, if you find the simplicity, that's how you know you have reached a certain point of 
uh, divinity, enlightenment, or nirvana. And that is very accessible every day, every moment within that day. Let's get into the Variety Show wildcard. What are you going to deliver up in the headline segment? Sometimes we drop a poem. Sometimes we drop a, a chili bin take. I'm not sure what you're going to do. So can you just please kick us off with the headline status? Yeah, I, I can do that. Um, I'm not, well, call it a poem if you want. It's actually just a timeline. Um, the timeline being the timeline of the last year of Rebecca Stott's life, football ferns, um, midfielder slash defender slash she actually has been playing in the front line a couple of times in Melbourne city lately. Um, so February, 2021, Rebecca Stott is playing for Brighton and Hove Albion in the women's super league in England, pretty much the, like the top league on the planet at the moment. Um, when she's diagnosed with stage three Hodgkin lymphoma. So, um, this is February 2021. She flies back to Melbourne where she lives for, for treatment, um, which, you know, means a couple rounds of chemotherapy and all that that entails and those difficulties um, amidst the global pandemic, no less. July 2021, Rebecca Stock given the all clear, complete remission. Um, cancer's gone, sweet ass. Later in July 2021, she makes a return to the footy field playing an MPL game or two with Bulleen Lions, which is, a, um, you know, sort of, I, I wouldn't even say semi-pro, I'd say this is amateur football, um, but decent level of club amateur football in Australia where she sort of, you know, mates with the coach, nice and local teams, sort of, um, you know, getting getting those initial steps back into being a footballer again after all she'd been through 3rd of December 2020, 2021. Um, she starts for Melbourne City in week one of the current A-League season. Her return to professional football only lasts an hour in that game, a 1-0 win over Canberra, but she steadily builds up her match fitness across the rest of the season to now where she's like just a 90-minute player again for Melbourne City. Um, 8th of February, 2022, this very day that we're recording this, named in the football ferns. The named in the football ferns for her international return, kind of like the last major milestone other than, you know, actually playing for the national team again. Since the thing, and it, um, since, you know, her, her cancer um, battle, uh, however, you, I don't really like the, the terminology of calling it a battle or it's kind of a weird thing. But um, since the diagnosis, this, this is like the, the last major milestone in returning to international football, almost exactly a year since that diagnosis as well. So shout out to, shout out to Rebecca Stott, shout out to Stotty for a pretty crazy journey over the last year and back to where she started once again which uh, you know that is not something that a lot of people would be able to achieve from what she's been through i am going to chuck a grab a take from the chili bin of hot takes and i'm going to say that aotearoa's olympic success is uh kind of predicated on the wonderful wahine of aotearoa and i'm not Let's be honest here, Wildcard and our listeners. The combination of Olympics and China, it's a bit sketchy, it's a bit niggly, it's a bit tricky, and it's just a whole lot of uh, weirdness. However, we do have uh, Aotearoa Olympians who do seem to love their time in the Beijing Olympics and Māori order, kia kaha to them. But wind back to last year, Wildcard, the Tokyo Olympics, to my mind, was dominated by the quartet of Lydia Ko, Lisa Carrington, Valerie Adams, and the Sevens Wahine. They won medals, and they conducted themselves in glorious Aotearoa fashion, and they were my champions of the Aotearoa Olympic campaign. So no surprises then. We come to the Beijing Winter Olympics, and you know who knows? Who knows what else uh, the niche case will cover from the Winter Olympics there in Beijing? I don't know. We can't promise that we'll be there updating everything, but I can tell you that the trend is still applicable because Zoe Sadowski Sinnott, uh, she won the snowboard slope style tricky competition. She won Aotearoa's first ever Olympic, a winter Olympic gold medal. And not only is that an epic feat in itself, it is also completely in tune with what happened at the Tokyo Olympics. So I don't know uh, what other Kiwi Winter Olympic superstar is going to pop up in Beijing. 
I don't know what else is going to happen at the Beijing Winter Olympics from an Aotearoa perspective, but I can tell you that not only did Zoe Sadowski Sinnott win Aotearoa's first Olympic Winter Olympic medal, she is following on from the amazing work of our wahine at the Tokyo Olympics. We have Valerie Adams kind of signing off with a bang. Lisa Carrington, consistently excellent. Lydia Ko, the only golfer ever in the world, in the universe, with two Olympic medals. And of course, the Sevens Wahine conducting themselves in beautiful fashion as they won as well. Zoe Sadowski, Sinnott, just joins that group of powerful, uh, athletic, beautiful, glorious, genuine, charismatic Aotearoa Wahine dominating Aotearoa's Olympic mahi. Let's get a bit statistical here, Wildcard. Let's inject some vitamin statistics into our bloodstream. Yeah, um, I don't, I mean, I'm sure you uh, heard that the Wellington Phoenix had a nice win. The, the fellas did on the weekend, 3-1 um, over MacArthur FC. Joshua Soterio missed a couple of big chances in the first half, as he tends to do, but as he also tends to do. Kept on going, um, stayed at it, scored a couple of lovely goals in the second half. Uh, helping lead the team to a yeah to a three one win. Um, game before that, they'd lost in the FFA Cup semi final to eventual champs Melbourne Victory. But before that, two one win over Western United. Um, that was the first game back for for Gary Hooper and the debut for Gail Sandoval, and they both scored the the two goals. So um, two wins in a row as far as the A League goes. And I think that means we're now in the position, I'm ready to call it anyway, at least hopefully, of the, the annual Wellington Phoenix um, mid-season revival, which, like, go back to Mark Rudin's first season, right? 2018-19, um, his, his first and only season. Wellington Phoenix had um, five points after six games. They then, the, the, the sixth of those games was a draw, which then sparked um, the beginning of a nine-game unbeaten streak, went on to make the playoffs. Ufuk Talai's first season. 2019-20s, they had one point after their first five games. They lost their first four in a row. That draw in the fifth game, the first game of a nine-game unbeaten streak. Same thing as the season before. Went on to make the playoffs. In fact, they finished their um, was it uh, third or fourth place. It was their highest ever regular season finish. Last season, um, Ufuk Talai was in charge once more. Five points from their first eight games a little bit of a longer drought at the start. Um, took, them, took them longer to, to come out of it. The mid-season revival wasn't quite as like instant um, in this case, but they finished on an 11-game unbeaten streak. Missed the playoffs, but missed the playoffs by one point. This season, four points from their first six games. Very similar areas to what they've been doing in all these other seasons in terms of these slow starts, but just won two games in a row. Um, skyrocketed them up from last to seventh, I think, with the last win. Is this the start of the of another, you know, um, nine plus game unbeaten streak? Well, hopefully, because yeah, they've, they've, they've dropped a lot of points to start the season, but this tends to be what they do, apparently. This is just like how the Wellings and Phoenix fellas operate is they start slowly, they build into the season, and then and they get on a run, like a nice unbeaten run that is the launch pad for the rest campaign. So it's not too late whatsoever to, to be pushing for, for finals football again. They've got themselves right back in the mix just with a couple of wins. So if they can um, they can maintain this, sort of in similar levels to what they've done in past seasons after their slow starts, then we're, we're definitely back where they need to be. I am going to lay out some Lee Kasparic white fern statistics. And this is how I wish everyone knew Lee Kasparic. Unfortunately, a lot of people will now know of Lee Kasparic for being dropped from the White Ferns World Cup squad because that was one of the uh, headline selection decisions made for the White Ferns World Cup squad. And the key point here is that the White Ferns are in a wider rubbish bin of poo rather than just this Lee Kasparik situation. But with regards to Lee Kasparik specifically, Lee Kasparik did not make the Women's World Cup squad. Lee Kasparik is also, uh, also took the most wickets of any White Ferns bowler in ODI cricket in 2021. 14 wickets, average of 14, RPO of 4.5. Next best spinner 
for the White Ferns and ODIs last year was Amelia Kerr, six wickets, so more than half the amount of wickets at an average of 40. Kasparik was averaging 14. Amelia Kerr, global superstar, she was averaging 40. Two other spinners made the World Cup squad. Fran Jonas, she took no wickets at an RPO of 6.36, and Francis Mackay took no wickets at an RPO of 5.81. So, yeah, shout out Lee Kasparik. But there's more. Lee Kasparik is second for total White Ferns wickets since January 1st, 2015. Leah Tahuhu has 69 wickets and an average of 29. Lee Kasparik has second. She has 65 wickets and an average of 19. Amelia Kerr has 60 wickets and an average of 25. So Lee Kasparik has 65 wickets and an average of 19. She is the only one of those three bowlers to be averaging below 20. And she has been better for the White Ferns and ODI cricket than Amelia Kerr. And of course, we know Amelia Kerr. She's a superstar. She's a, one of the, she's a young phenom, bat and ball. But Lee Kasparik's been better with the ball. And this World Cup is being played in Aotearoa. So if we channel this down to just ODIs in Aotearoa since January 1st, 2015, Leah Tahuhu, 32, 30 wickets and an average of 29. Lee Kasparik, 25 wickets and an averaging average of 17. Amelia Kerr, 22 wickets and an average of 33. So once again, Lee Kasparik, the only one of those three bowlers, averaging below 20. So Lee Kasparik, she was the best White Ferns bowler in 2021 in ODI cricket. Lee Kasparik is the second best White Ferns ODI bowler since 2015, as far as wickets go and as far as efficiencies go, she is the best. And she is also the best in Aotearoa. So that is Lee Kasparik's amazing ODI record. Fair case to be made that she is the best ODI bowler Aotearoa has had over the past seven years. Certified case that she is Aotearoa's best ODI spinner during this period as well. There we have it. Let's get deep into the Mangroves here wild card. Can you please take us into the Flying Kiwis realm? Yeah, let's talk some Liberato Kakache after he made his Serie A debut for Empoli. Um, got 20 minutes at the end of a nil draw against Bologna. And actually, like, he he looked solid, man. He, like, he came in, he was, um, I don't even remember, Marco Arnautovic, the Austrian strike, used to play for West Ham alongside... Um, in front of Winston Reid once upon a time. Um, he was playing striker for Bologna, and he's a he's a nuggety, tough fella. And Libby actually at one point, like, shouldered him off the ball and sent him flying, and, and Adovich is there begging for a free kick that never arrived. It was awesome. Um, but, it, like, even apart from that, like, that just shows a fella who's not afraid to get stuck in at a higher level. His his passing was good. He was, um, he was making clever, you know, decisions with the ball at his feet. He was defensively in the right positions. All these things, um, trying to get forward as well, bringing energy. Like, he was... It was the kind of 20-minute cameo debut performance where you're like, yeah, this guy's going to stick around. Like, he's going to get plenty more games the rest of the season. So for a for a player making the step up as he was, that's fantastic. Um, he's also, of course, the first Kiwi male footballer to play in Serie A full stop. There's been, I think, um, Liam Graham played briefly in Serie B. Um, don't know how to say B in Italian. Uh, Serie B. And Nico Kerwin spent last season as well in, in Serie B as well. Um, but no one had played in the top flight in Italy before as a New Zealand uh, international. So Liberato Kakache uh, walking um, uncharted ground there and looking across like the other of the, because the Italian league is one of the big, it's like known as one of the big five leagues in Europe. Um this was Eli. He was the first Kiwi player to play in Italy. Uh, no Kiwi player has ever played in Spain, La Liga. Um, France, Iltuiloma is the one dude. Two small substitute appearances for Olympic Marseille back in the days where I think, uh, you know, a few people, there's probably be people who are surprised to hear this, but his coach back then who gave him those debuts was Marcelo Bielsa. Now, you know, we're a, a hipster, he was already a hipster darling there. He's even more of a hipster darling now coaching Leeds United in the Premier League. So direct link there between him and Bill Tuiloma. Germany, Sapreet Singh played twice for Bayern Munich, of course, but he wasn't the first. Uh, Winston Rufa 
famously trailblazed that um, that path before him. You know, a couple of decades earlier, he played 174 times in the Bundesliga. And then, of course, we've got the English Premier League, where there's been six uh, Kiwi fellows, and three of them have played, you know, really extensively. Um, Lee Norfolk was the first three appearances. Danny Hay made four appearances as well. And Ryan Nelson, still the Kiwi leading appearance maker in any of the big five leagues. Um, 198 appearances in the Premier League for him. Simon Elliott played 12 times. Um, funny to remind myself as well, looking at this, that Chris Wood actually debuted in the Premier League before Winston Reid did. Uh, it's once upon a time coming off the bench for West Brom when he was still a teenager. So Chris Wood's played 157 times in the Premier League, scored 50 goals too. Uh, closing in, and we'll probably surpass him by the end of the season, closing in on Winston Reid, he played 166 times for West Ham. Of course, this is only the fellas. If you look at the um, the women's stuff as well, Kakache, not the first um Kiwi footballer full stop to play in an Italian top division because Katie Roode played six times for Juventus a few years ago. Um, it is hard to get good stats, though, on the historical stats on a lot of the women's leagues. Plus, there's the trickiness of like, um, you know, is this because it's a little bit different here. The American league is a lot more powerful with the women. Is the Swedish league as good as some of these? Arguably, it might be. Um, but just from what I like, just going into the last few years as well. I do have full stats for the um, for the Women's Super League in England. So I can tell you Rhea Percival's 59 games there, far and away the most for a Kiwi. Olivia Chance is next with 26. You also got Rosie White, Haley Bowden, Bessie Hassett, Anna Green, Katie Duncan, Ellie Riley, Katie Rude, Rebecca Stott, Sarah Gregorius, Emma Kitte, Aaron Clancy, and most recently, an elite. Uh, three appearances for West Ham this season, the most recent. Um, Germany's had heaps as well. I, I literally couldn't list them all. There's been probably at least as many as England, if not more. Um, and in France, I believe Aaron Nail is the only one, but I could be wrong because, like I say, it's hard to it's hard to find the um, historical stats. And in Spain, again, no Kiwi male has played La Liga. No Kiwi woman, as far as I can tell, has played in the Spanish top flight, although Amber Hearn did sign there, was going to play for uh, Leganes, I think it was. But that was about the time that she did her ACL and ended up retiring. So that didn't quite happen. Um, but there you go. Uh, Kiwi footballers plays and trails across the top leagues in Europe. Libby Kikache, just the latest in a, in a long and very quickly expanding these days heritage. Aotearoa has a long heritage of combat sports. And sure. also quickly expanding. Specifically yep. with the UFC. And this weekend we have Israel Adesanya fighting Robert Whitaker rematch after Adesanya finished Robert Whitaker in Australia. And I think that card, that event, still has the largest like live crowd ever for a UFC event. Um now Israel Adesanya is fighting Robert Whitaker in Houston. Also on this card, we have Carlos Ulberg in his second UFC fight after a first up loss. And Mike Blood Diamond, Matheta, is making his UFC debut. And apparently Blood Diamond used to sleep under the ring at City Kickboxing. And he is a fascinating character. So if you want to watch a funky fighter, for sure check out Blood Diamond. Because um, everything I've seen and heard about Blood Diamond suggests that he is an entertaining fighter. However, here wildcard deep in the mangroves, I'm not talking about fighting. I'm not talking about one else. I'm talking about business. Because Israel Asanya, I've heard numerous people state that he is coming off contract with the UFC. And a couple of weeks ends ago, we had Francis Ngannou winning the heavyweight title or defending his heavyweight title in the midst of an ongoing contract situation with the UFC. Of course, we all know, you hopefully know by now, if you've been listening to the Niche Cage for a long time, or if you're a UFC mixed martial arts fan, you've definitely heard the headlines about how UFC fighters are underpaid and how the UFC does a terrible job of splitting their profits among their fighters. So, heavyweight champion of the world, Francis Ngannou, might want to fight for a purse that actually is reasonable for him. And that's where we have like uh, old UFC stars going into boxing. And there's a lot of hype around boxing right now because you can actually earn the money that market value suggests you are worth. Okay. And now we're coming into Israel Adesanya. I believe Israel Adesanya is the biggest UFC superstar. 
I believe Israel Asanya is the global face of the UFC. I believe Israel Asanya is a revolutionary type of athlete. And I am intrigued about his ongoing situation with the UFC. Um, this has been intriguing me for a while, ever since I heard that he is coming off contract. And then shout out to Submission Radio out of Australia. They do a lot of interviews with uh, city kickboxing fighters. They do have a Blood Diamond interview where I pulled that nugget about him sleeping under the octagon. And they do have another interview with Eugene Beerman. One of the dudes from Submission Radio asked Eugene Beerman about some lack of a promotion, a lack of hype from the UFC with regards to Israel Asanya. From the outside looking in, Israel Asanya is the face of the UFC, massive superstar around the world. Um, not only around the world, but he's got a massive following in Africa, understandably, and Australasia, understandably. One of the dudes from Submission Radio noted that there was a that that superstar status is not necessarily met with push and promo and hype from the UFC. He asked Eugene Behrman about that. Eugene Behrman was very coy, didn't want to elaborate. He just suggested that there were some ongoing things with the UFC being in the, in the mix. One of the dudes from Submission Radio did then share the note that Israel Adesanya has two fights left on his UFC contract. And this sets up an amazing 2022 for Israel Adesanya because Israel Adesanya is someone who could earn a lot more money outside the UFC. And of course, this will have implications for City Kickboxing because City Kickboxing has had a very good relationship, a very good working relationship with the UFC. They have brought all their other fighters, Carlos Ulberg, Brad Vidal, Kaikara France, Shane Young, all those dudes, Blood Diamond coming into the UFC on the back of uh, largely due to the fact that Israel Adesanya has been as advertised. Right now, it feels like given the UFC's attitude towards fighter pay and the opportunities presented to their fighters because uh, Francis Ngannou can't go and do boxing while under contract with the UFC, Israel Adesanya can't go and do boxing while under contract with the UFC. So those opportunities are limited. And then you have the financial elements where these dudes can earn a lot more money outside the UFC. And now we have this nugget via the submission radio interview where the UFC have a history of getting very niggly with fighters coming off contract. So if I'm connecting the dots, reading the tea leaves here, the UFC may not want to celebrate Israel Adesanya too much if he's coming off contract. And this, again, alludes to a fascinating storyline throughout 2022, but right here, right now, leading into this rematch with Robert Whittaker, um, because Israel Adesanya is a superstar, and given his standing in international sport, he may be worth too much for the UFC. Or... A lot of these city kickboxing dudes, they have their business outside the UFC sorted beautifully. So they may, that may not be an issue. This is why it's fascinating. This is why it's interesting. And that, all of that funk, all of that intrigue is outside the one-out scrap. This is about the business. And you have heard the headlines. You've seen all the headlines about the UFC's business practices. Now we are about to experience it with our champion, Israel Adesanya. The dude who came to Aotearoa, stayed in Rotorua, Whanganui, moved up to Auckland, training, leading city kickboxing. Now, he may move into the space of pushing mixed martial arts forward from a business situation. Because the UFC are pretty fucking weird. And Israel Adesanya is a global superstar. And I am fascinated to see how that plays out in the coming months. I've got a question here, Wildcard, for you. South Africa versus the Black Caps. We've had both squads announced. The Black Caps named their squad South Africa. They're coming from South Africa for two tests at Hagley Oval. We know what Hagley Oval does. Not too much spin. 
And of course, the Black Caps test squad is only for the first test. I'm curious, Wildcard. Would you rather be South Africa with two very good frontline, well, not very good, two good frontline spinners in their test squad? They have Maharaj and Simon Hama. Would you rather be the Black Caps going with the part time spin option of Rachin Ravindra? Mm, these three may not add, play a game at all, right? They're just in squads. So I'm not asking you to predict who would play, how they'll play, how they'll perform. I'm just asking you right now, would you rather be a South African touring team with a very good pace attack and a couple of good seam, uh, spinners? Or would you rather be the Black Caps in this current uh, incarnation of their test squad with the sometimes spinner, Rachin Ravindra? I yeah, it's like uh, would you would you rather be like Brad Pitt but with a different color uh, hair or like it's I I don't think it matters um whatsoever which spin like um if you can like I mean we're talking about a test match two test matches actually aren't we at at Hagley Oval in Christchurch where I think. In the last five years or something like that, last time I looked it up, I think spinners have averaged about 60 on that wicket. It's the the spinners graveyard of um, of Aotearoa, which is the spinners graveyard of world cricket in terms of like nations. Um, I, I don't think it may. In fact, it's probably, I'm going to pick a side. I'm, I think I'll go with the black caps because I'd rather just be like, Let's pick. Uh, we we have a part time option just in case. He's probably not a reliable test bowler at this um, point in their career, but like that means we've prioritized other aspects. Now South Africa still, as you say, have a gun bowling lineup in terms of their pace attack, so it's not really an issue. But that's why I get to like the um, so I, I both teams are coming out there looking extremely sexy with their um with their bowling lineups. Although Trent Bolt not there for the for the first test, which um makes it a little bit friskier um i don't think like the the like the the appendages of your um of your spin attack are going to be decisive in the test match uh and anyway i think colin de Gronholm plays the role of a spinner for the black caps in home test matches normally and he's he's back so there you go but would who who do you rather be the black caps i'm black taking caps. the black caps oh, yeah. for clarity of preparation i think which is a, you don't always get to say that about the black cats but in this case i think the the last few years of them just being like wait why are we picking spinners in home test matches like i think they've they've sort of figured out a you know chucked apart a whatever you call chucked aside a, a commonly held belief that you always need a spinner and being like well actually maybe we don't um and i think that's a that's a nice brave choice that they've gone with in the last few years your question my question. Um, can I throw a bonus question at you as well? I, I have a I have one on the NBA, but I'm curious about um, some of the, to use your own word, um, repeated, but definitely heartfelt, like the fascinating Adesanya situation. Is that the first time where there's been like a, a major talent, potentially, because it hasn't happened yet, but if it did, it's like, would this be the first time there'd been like a major talent um, showdown contractually sort of thing? Because I'm, no, I'm thinking not of- at all. Um, because like Conor McGregor obviously making a lot of money doing some boxing stuff during his career, but it was sort of later on in his um, time with the end, like Ronda Rousey going to wrestling is another like two examples there of like the two biggest stars that sport has ever had making good money outside of UFC. But yeah, like so you're saying it's not, Adesanya wouldn't be like the first one to, to go head to head in that way. No, oh, he's not even the first one of 2022. Like it's Francis, Francis and Ganu is leading the charge. And right. as the heavyweight champion of the world, like some would argue that's more um, important than like yeah. Adesanya, but obviously I'm biased. So I'm going to throw Adesanya as the biggest star in the world. Um, but the way the UFC conduct their contracts and their fighter pay, this is something that happens every year. Right. You like, you just don't hear about it because you weren't paying attention to the UFC in 2006, yeah. you know, it's just or his turn now rather than, or yeah. you don't know the fighters who have actually been in those situations. Cause like not only do the UFC like not 
split their revenue how other leagues and other competitions should do. There's no fighter union. Um, their contracts are just like six fight contracts and if you champion like you you might get like automatically more fights on your contract or like they have they have ways of keeping fighters under contract that are not the best things for the fighters so their whole contractual system is pretty shady but this is definitely not unique in any way shape or form it's just escalated because we're from Aotearoa and it's Adesanya also though because now you've got the boxing stuff happening yeah right where um ufc fighters clearly see that they can earn double triple quadruple the amounts of money that they earn in a ufc fight in a boxing fight and obviously the ufc are a bit insecure about that so right now it's a um perfect storm for me personally as well coming from aotearoa with adesanya with city kickboxing because they, they have a fantastic working relationship with the UFC, but as far as uh, historically goes, this is like an annual event, maybe, you know? <laughs> Sounds like maybe even more than an annual event. It's, um, anyway, second question is also about uh, Kiwis who are involved with an um, American sporting organization. We're going to the NBA here. Um, nice and simple question. Which team goes further in the NBA playoffs? Steven Adams' Memphis Grizzlies or Sean Marks' Brooklyn Nets? Easy mahi. Yep. Easy mahi. It's the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies are the funkiest NBA team and, of course, Steven Adams. So I also hope that the further the Grizzlies go through the NBA season into the finals and winning the NBA championship, the spotlight on Stephen Adams will grow far brighter. So it's kind of hope, but I'm confident that the Memphis Grizzlies are going to go further than the Brooklyn Nets, let's just say that. And I think the way the NBA season's turning out, a lot of people, are, again, American culture, USA culture, they're worried on a lot of the big fish stuff happening they're worrying they're worrying about the stuff that um they typically worry themselves about and then you've got like memphis grizzlies stuff just churning out and i think it's a bit of a shift in what's important in the nba and i think the memphis grizzlies represent that and i think stephen adams is a key figure in that and i think stephen adams is going to be a hero of the next four months in the nba how about that for a motherfucking prediction well, if they go if they go far, then that's without doubt. I mean, they could; those two teams could technically meet in the NBA Finals. One's you know East, one's West. So, like the Grizzlies are starting to get some of that recognition, is what I'm saying from from wider NBA circles. But they're still a small market team, and there's just a, like they're a young team as well, and they're a team that hasn't made a deep, deep, deep playoff run yet in this incarnation. And I still get a lot of condescending might be a little bit of a hard thing, but it's like they, they talked about like it's a it's a cute story a little bit. And I'm like, now these guys are from everything I've seen from them in the last two months, this team is a championship contender. And there are a lot of other very good teams. That doesn't mean like if they don't win, a, if they don't like make the Western Conference finals and they've failed or anything like that, um, the Western Conference is stacked at the top there. But they're a legit team, and I think they're still come playoff time. Like, they've got the capabilities to ramp things up when they get to that point, and I think other teams are still taking them a little bit too lightly. So it's going to be a pretty crazy story if they can go on a run, which I genuinely think they're capable of. Musical jam here, Wildcat. Yeah. Um, new album by Kate LeBon. One of my favorites, so I, I haven't listened to it yet, but I've heard a couple of the singles. Sounds like it's a lot similar to her last album, which was a little sort of a little bit poppier compared to a sort of like uh, freaky Welsh folk um, garage rock kind of things. I I just hope she's playing plenty of like guitar lines on that. Um, we'll see how that goes. Mitski's got a new album as well. It's talking about uh, indie rocks, kind of uh, probably royalty at this point. It's probably fair to say. Um, and there's a jazz album I want to listen to that I found on Bandcamp via um, Aquarium Drunkard shout out 
by a guy called Luke Stewart. The, well, there's two of them, the Luke Stewart and Jarvis Earnhardt Quartet. Um, apparently, this Luke Stewart guy is a sitar player. So, you know, like Ravi Shankar, like the, um, the, the Indian kind of like um, twangy uh, stringed instrument there. So I just want to hear what um, sitar based uh, modern jazz sounds like. It sounds amazing. Plus also there's a, there's a Grateful Dead's Dave Picks volume 41 is out and volume 40 was kick ass. So looking forward to 41. It was, a, I think it's a mid seventies set, nice and stacked. And those ones are good with the, um, they're real good with the, uh, what do you call them? The remasterings and stuff of the old live shows. So we'll see how that one goes. We'll see how that one goes as well. I have been thoroughly enjoying the new album from Saba, S-A-B-A, from the Pivot Gang. A few good things. Early contender for the most fucking epic album right now and recent memory and probably the next opposite of the memory. The foresight, the future, because it's fucking excellent. It's so funky, so fun, so vibrant. It's, uh, you know, he's a young dude, so it's it's rooted in, you know, modern ideas and modern lingo and uh, just a fresh vibe, but it's also like old soul-y. You know, he's an old soul. He incorporates a wide range of music. It's just fun. It's just fresh. It's like... A lot of the music I listen to is like a bit too musically, like a, like you get into a lot of the Earl Sweatshirt, the um, the Alchemist type of stuff that I always talk about, and it's uh, it's fantastic to listen to. It's just not necessarily fresh and vibrant and funky and just like uplifting. Sub is all of that, and Few Good Things is all of that, and it's an amazing listen. It's a beautiful project. So shout it out. It's a few good things from Saba, and that's the Niche Cash Variety Show. Big it up to yourself, love yourself, care cars, stay beautiful. We'll be back on Thursday with another episode of The Niche Cast. Cheers.